Welcome to Liberty in America, Past, Present, and Future with Dr. Bill Choby. Doc is a historian and a reenactor. On this show, you'll hear his thoughts about our personal liberties from their earliest recorded beginnings. You'll also be transported back to the 1750s to relive the life of Colonel George Washington and his adventures during the French and Indian War. Let's get started. Here's Dr. Bill Choby. Hello there. Hi, Dr. Bill Choby again. Uh, this is a part of our series on liberty in America, past, present, and future. And the uh, last uh, session we had, we talked about the founding of the Republic and part one. Today, we're going to do part two. Now, uh, mind you, there's. I am going to try to uh, bring this all together for you. Uh, but in order to do that, I need to have some uh, direct quotations to be read to you. So uh, just so you understand it, I'm just not doing this off the cuff. I want to make sure that these words are accurate. The last time we talked, we talked about the Declaration of Independence and how it became um, the, the uh, stimulus for the development of resistance to the crown. And um, the people that signed that Declaration of Independence, there were 56 of them, uh, they, they paid a heavy price for for standing up to the uh, tyranny of, of uh, Great Britain. Uh, five were captured, uh, five of the 56 were captured and killed by the British. Um, Twelve lost their homes to looting and, and burnings and such, and uh, two of them, their only sons to the war. Uh, when it was all said and done, a total of nine of the original uh, 56 signers gave their lives for the great promise that uh, we enjoy today. So at, at the um, uh, at the time, it wasn't a universal belief that um, our country was going to succeed. Uh, a lot of people still had uh, allegiance to the crown. In fact, about 40% of the people. And uh, another 40% just didn't want to get involved. No, that doesn't sound familiar. Uh, a lot of people like to stay in the middle of the road where it's nice and safe. But about 20% were the ones that actually fought for our freedom. And uh, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. Uh, now, after the uh, about four years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence and our government started getting organized, they, uh, the, we developed our first legal entry and uh, the first constitution, you know, on what was called the Articles of Confederation. And this was crafted by the uh, Second Continental Congress. And um, it was uh, signed, uh, sent to the states in uh, November of 1777 and fully ratified by uh, March of 1781. So you can imagine a lot of discussion about this to take that long. And the first part of the Articles of Confederation uh, reads as such, Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union between the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. That uh, statement, perpetual union, I may have mentioned before, was uh, really the basis that Abraham Lincoln used to say that secession from the union by these states was a violation of the Articles of Confederation, and uh, particularly from the South. But uh, as we well know, the war went on, and uh, there, they had many skirmishes uh, here and there, but I'm not really here to talk about that so much, but I do want to say at the very end in October of 1781, General Cornwallis was cornered in Yorktown with the help of the French fleet and the French soldiers. And um, that end to led to the um, uh, cessation of uh, the major cessations of hostilities with the, the British in America. A um, couple sidelines uh, during the siege of Yorktown. The, uh, the French were able to, uh, because of a favorable wind that prohibited the British ships from leaving the Chesapeake Bay and, and uh, permitted the temporary uh, placement of the Fr French fleet, which was a blockade. And uh, from those, uh, those ships, they were able to also launch uh, uh, cannon fire and mortars into the town of Yorktown. While on the on land, George Washington ordered that a cannon be fired every minute, twenty four seven, and he actually set the first one off. So they uh, they really uh, cornered uh, Colonel Cornwallis and the British, and uh, through some heroic acts, uh, Alexander Hamilton and uh, others, they were able to secure the 
positions of the readouts number 11 and I believe it was 15, which put them in the mortar range of Yorktown. And the mortar, of course, was uh, a cannonball that had a, a, an explosive charge in it so they could launch these over the walls and into the town and blow up and start fires. So different as opposed to a cannonball, which is just totally solid shot. It's more to just to destroy, but it has a longer range. Uh, okay, well, let's go back to the Constitution. Now, uh, in summer of uh, 1787, the, the delegates from, from the 13 colonies got together with this uh, Articles of Confederation. And um, later on, they had a, a new president every year, and he was uh, an individual that would preside over Congress, and that's where we get, we get the word president. But... Um, with one of those was Arthur St. Clair, which I'm relatively familiar with. And he was sort of an unsung hero of the revolution. But uh, he was, when he was president of Congress assembled, then he was the one that uh, got together the Congress to talk about creating a, a constitution. And he was the one that presented or appointed George Washington to preside over those deliberations. And again, that's how we get the word president. But the uh, Madison, who was called the father of the Constitution, I mean, he had uh, many different thoughts. And he had many contributions to this. But one of them that was most profound, I believe, is that he said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But because we are not angels, we need a, a form of government to uh, keep us uh, you know, civil to one another or you know, make a society, if you will. But... Um, he also later wrote that part of this, um, uh, keeping this all together, was that there had to be the room for dissent, and that uh, it was because of that. And he says, uh, and I quote, no political truth is certainly of greater intrinsic value or is stamped with the authority of more enlightened patrons of liberty than that on which the objection is founded, end of quote. In other words... Uh, brisk debate over issues was essential for the preservation of liberty. So this, uh, the Constitution debated back and forth for many months, and finally September 17th of 1787, the, uh, the representatives signed it, and of course there had to be a period of ratification which went on for much longer. Now, the, the idea of the Constitution essentially is that there's three branches of government and that we had the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Now, these ideas were not new because, in fact, our founders had uh, pulled that basic idea out of the Bible. And at the time, you know, many of the, of course, all the founders had a pretty solid working uh, understanding of how the Bible went. But in Isaiah 33, 22, it states, and quote, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king, end of quote. There's three branches of government. You've got the judge, the lawgiver, and the king. So this is, this is where the idea of three branches of government came from with checks and balances on one another. Uh, incidentally, one of the battle cries for the War of the Independence was that, quote, no king but King Jesus, quote. Uh, so they have the three functions of government, and uh, the idea was just to keep it all in balance, and this way you wouldn't have tyrants arising and, and people like the, you know King George and all the other un unfortunate experiences that we went through in getting to where we were at that time. But the uh, with uh, one of the quotes that um, that was made by George Washington at the termination of this. Of the, he said that, quote, should the states reject this excellent constitution, the probability is that an opportunity will never again offer to cancel another in peace. The next one will be drawn in blood, end of quote. So he, he pretty much put his imprimatur on, on what was done uh, in, in that constitutional convention. And then, uh, then Ben Franklin, as he exited from the Constitution Hall, was asked, like, uh, what, have you, what have you wrought? And he answered to them and directly to the point, it was, quote, was a republic if you can keep it, end of quote. And then uh, John Adams commented that our Constitution, quote, our Constitution was designed only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other, end of quote. 
And on another occasion, Washington re, uh, stated, and quote, we have raised a standard to which the good and the wise can repair. The event is in the hands of God, end of quote. And he later wrote, it's the father of our country writing this. I remember, you know, being the, the indispensable man. The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finely stated, on the experiment entrusted in the hands of the American people, end of quote. They see that there's very strong religious undertonings to this whole thing. And so after uh, two years after the uh, uh, final vote on it, it took to ratify it. And then uh, there was a series of articles defending this, this constitution during this time of national deliberation. And it was with John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. And they, they published these articles in the newspaper, like letters to the editor uh, under the term of Publius. And they've he anonymously uh, written as it was, but we know who they are today. And they were became, became known as the Federalist Papers. And if you ever really have an interest in looking into what was really going on through their heads at this time, I would encourage you to read the Federalist Papers, cover to cover. Lots of books are available on it. But here's uh, one from Federalist number 14, Madison wrote, and, and he's explained some of these ideas as, as a quote. It is that in a democracy, the people meet and exercise the government in person. In a republic, they assemble and administer it by their representatives and agents. A democracy, consequently, will be confined to a small spot. A republican may be extended to a large region, end of quote. And he wrote later on in Federalist 39, if we resort for a criterion to the different principles upon which different forms of government are established, we may define a republic to be, or at least may bestow that name on, a government which derives its power directly or indirectly from the great body of people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited period. It is essential to such government that it be deprived from the great body of society. Now, the people that claim our country is a democracy are lying to you. Anybody who repeats that it says our democracy, our democracy, that it's like, you know, it's just like nirvana of government. It's a lie when it comes to the Constitution of the United States. And I'm going to show you this a little later, too, why they insisted on this, our country being a republic, a representative republic. And, and quite frankly, the word democracy does not exist in the Constitution, but the word republic does. So uh, the preamble to the Constitution and it's just uh, the, the unique document that we have here. Is, this is where right becomes might and the people are free. Mind you remember our main motto throughout this uh, series is that when might is right, the people are in bondage. When right is might, people are free. So let, let me just go through a little bit here. It's just the first, the preamble of our Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, because remember the Articles of Confederation were not a good union. In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. So here, let me just briefly go through uh, some of the highlights of the Constitution that relate to uh, liberty for us. The Article One it established the Congress, and it consists of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and then the uh, and the eligibility of the voters, and uh, it had to provide for national currency, to coin money, bills of credit, etc., and anything but gold and silver coin, a tender, a payment of debt. So gold and silver, backed currency, was the foundational. A unit of monetary value in the United States. This, this existed up until, I believe it was Roosevelt, FDR, that, that took some gold off the standard and it just, you know, it meant the, the value of a dollar to be anything. And it's one of the reasons why we have such crazy inflation and why it's so hard to predict the, the actual value of a dollar. But when it's back with a finite amount of uh, gold, then because there was a finite amount of it, then that set the, uh, the value of the gold, and that's at the value of the dollar, gold or silver. It was part of the original plan. 
Now, the uh, Article 2 talks about the executive branch with the president and vice president. Article 3 talks about the judiciary. And uh, this is where the systems of courts and their jurisdictions and such. Article 4 relates to the rights and privileges of citizens in the states, and it guarantees the states, quote, in this union, a Republican form of government, and it shall protect each of them against invasion and domestic violence. Think about that. The word Republican, if you want to have a state that joins the union, it has to have a Republican form of government. In other words, the only way we have a United States of America is that they all have the same form of government, a Republican form of government, not a democracy, a Republican form of government. So anybody that, that says anything to you about this being a democracy, correct them on the spot because it's nothing but repeating the lies of, of people who like to make it seem like democracy is better than republic. And with a democracy, of course, it's mob rules. We well know, and we see that even today. Once you get a hold of the power, then that's the end of it. There you go. And you have, have a minority of, in power is just going to tell everybody what to do. And we're back to the tyranny of Great Britain. Um, so... Moving on to Article 5, this is where, this is really curious, because this is where the Constitution can be amended. It takes two-thirds of the House, or, this is very important now, or two-thirds of the state legislature. And then ratification would require three-quarters of all the state legislature to become law. The states have the power, through a convention, to change the Constitution without the permission of Congress or the President. And this was put in there by Alexander Hamilton, in order to prevent the day, and actually what we're seeing today, where the permanent Congress, the uniparty of, uh, of power and wealth in Washington, has become to a point where it's so, uh, so well protected uh, by virtue of using our laws and abusing, stretching our laws, that the, the, the rest of the states have been left out of the picture and uh, we've become a house of lords and, and uh, that has to change. But here's the... the the uh, reason or the process by which the states can change. And it's currently, as I speak, I believe there's 19 states have signed on with the Convention of States. And if we get to that point of, uh, I believe, 34, that the states agree to amending the Constitution, then that'll go through the process to where they'll do write the actual bills. And then if 33 fourths of the states agree to that, it becomes a constitutional amendment without the need or without the input of the congressmen and the presidents and all the other uh, people in the swamp in Washington. So real important to know, real important to know. Alexander Hamilton put that in there. And of course, Washington agreed with it. As it was, he said, you know, as I previously mentioned, if, if, uh, if we don't do something about this, when uh, the need comes to amend, it will lead to bloodshed. And certainly we would hate to see that happen. Now, the uh, Article 7 or Article 6 had to do with the retirement of debts, requirement of the officials to be bound by an oath to support the Constitution, and, and no religious uh, test for qualifications of office. Article 7 requires ratification by at least nine of the 13 states for the establishment of the Constitution to be binding of the law. Also in this section, there's uh, if you read through it, Article 7, um, uh, Section 7, uh, where are we here? I think it's Article 4, Section 7. About the, uh, the legislature, the legislature, the House, Congress passes a bill, sends it to the president, and the president has uh, so many days to decide if he's going to sign it or veto it. In fact, mm -hmm. he has 10 days. But the, in those 10 days, one, if you read it carefully, it says, except Sunday. It's in little markers, little brackets except Sunday. It's 10 days, but not counting a Sunday, to which to decide whether or not he wants to veto, and if he doesn't do anything, it becomes law. Uh, but those people who say this is not a Christian doctrine need to look at that, because sun, the use of Sunday, excluding Sunday, is a Christian uh, uh, process, a Christian uh, uh, day of worship. So I'd also like to mention, we get to the very end of this, it also states, which affirms that it's a Christian document, in the year of our Lord, it's at the very end of it, in the year of our Lord, uh, of 1789, I believe it was, that's in there because that's the language that they used at the time. And it shows that their faith was very important to them. And it's very important to this document. So all those naysayers out there about what Christianity is and whether or not we're a Christian country, 
uh, is, is just a bunch of BS. So to take it with a grain of salt. If anybody complains about it, you just show them those two things I just told you, uh, along with them, tell them it's not a democracy with the Republic stuff. But it's where they, they can't count Sundays to uh, on how many days a president can review a bill. Or at the very end of it, it's a year of our Lord. And uh, anyhow. Okay. So it was um, really by the... Um, the persistence and the, the, the uh, hammering out the differences that came up with this unique document was really set us free for 250 some odd years. But uh, there was a quote that came along by Alexis de Tocqueville in 1835. So now you're looking at probably 50 years of uh, this experiment in action. And he sort of summed it up. And I'd like to read that to you as well. The peace and prosperity and the very existence of the union are vested in the hands of the justices of the Supreme Court. Without them, the Constitution would be a dead letter. The executive appeals to them for assistance against encroachments of the legislative power. The legislature demands her protection from the assaults of the executive. They defend the union from the disobedience of the states, the states from the exaggerated claims of the union public interest against private interest and the conservative spirit of stability against the fickleness of the democracy. <laughs> Here we are, the democracy word again. You see, it, it's just, it doesn't fit our, our country. So that's the end of the founding of the Republic. That's the end of my little discussion today for you. And I encourage you to stay tuned. We try to do this once a week and uh, we're going to be doing this for uh, a number of weeks, but uh, please stop back in and visit my website drbiltrovybooks.com you can leave uh, messages there with me or you can review some of the things that are in my book um, and I would encourage you to actually go out and buy them uh, that's always uh, always good for me <laughs> thank you so much and uh, I'll see you next time <laughs>